wish you New Year's blessings from somewhere on the road between here and North Carolina. Prayers for safe travels and their return this evening. And Happy New Year from myself. We are pleased to welcome Reverend Luke Boker, who will be leading the worship service today. Prayer requests. We uh, wish to offer prayers for Elton Sherman, who is recovering uh, from surgery. Uh, for Dave Bloom, who I believe right now is in Arizona. I sure hope that the, uh, the warm weather and dry air is restorative for him. Oh, it was canceled? 7th of January, so they're on their way. They'll get there, I'm sure. So we, we do hope that that is restorative for him. And then uh, Gina Gillespie Ryan. Uh, she really needs a lot of, of prayers uh, from us. And at this time, we'd like to light a prayer candle for um, Melissa Trumpy. And with the help of... Um, there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. We offer prayers for Melissa Trumpy. Uh, we'll keep in, in uh, our prayers for her children, Gary and Denise Gilbertson and the family. I might also add that the poinsettia that I failed to mention last week down here is in memory of Jim Meyer from his family. Be aware that the gathering Zoom meeting will resume on January 18th at 6.30 p.m. And if you would like to attend, please email Pastor Lance or the church office, and they will send you that link. This is a change. Last week I said it was the 11th, but that has been changed to the 18th. Uh, the gathering is a time for fellowship where we talk about current happenings from a Christian perspective. Also a reminder that the afternoon Zoom Bible study on Luke will resume January 13th as well. And if you'd like to attend, please email Pastor Lance or the church office, and they will send you that link also. And the evening discussion of Genesis will also start January 13th. Uh, that's at 7 o'clock in the church lounge here. We're looking through the very first book of the Bible. There's so much information that we may or may not perceive from our old Sunday school days. The good thing is no preparation is needed, so just come on in and Bring an open mind, and uh, you'll be seeing, you'll be uh, participating in readings, videos, and discussion. You'll be part of this journey through the text. <clears throat> also, due to proto, uh, COVID protocol, we will not be collecting offerings, um, but there is a, a plate just outside the door here in the entry where you will be able to leave your tithes and offerings, and we thank you for that. Oh, live stream is up and running, and uh, it was actually starting last week already. Uh, so a live version of our service uh, from this point forward will be uh, available for those who physically can't be with us, and uh, we can all be together in spirit. And as we always say, the Lord is with you, and, and also with you. you. Now let us proclaim the good news of Christ Jesus in this new year. Thank you, Paul. It's good to be here again today on this snowy day um, and uh, to praise God and to give thanks for all the things that we've been blessed with. Uh, I give thanks this morning that we could be here because somebody got up at 3 o'clock and got in their trucks and, and cleared our roads for us and put down salt, and, and, and what a blessing, and I'm thankful that God provides that for us, and so many blessings that, that we have. One announcement that I have is that because of the Omicron virus, I'm not going to shake hands this morning. I know our hospitals are full, and we are... Uh, airplanes are delayed because our workers are getting sick, so I want to be very careful this morning. Um, and I, I love shaking hands with you guys, but this morning I'm going to take a bye on that. Well, it's time for our silent prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, God has blessed us all in, in so many ways. Some of the ways we overlook, we don't even think about them because the blessings keep coming all the time. 
So let's take time at the beginning of the service to, to focus in on those wonderful blessings and give thanks to God. Amen. Let's uh, go to our call to offering. Wisdom has been our companion and God's gift to us since time immemorial. What righteous path is wisdom leading you towards this Christmas season? What does wisdom beckon you to offer? Where does she want you and God's church to go? Let us dedicate the gifts that uh, you have given to support the ministry of this church and God's work, and let's use the prayer of dedication. Most wise and wondrous God, we pray that soon and very soon your blessings will cover the face of the earth like a mist, that divine offerings and the offerings of human hands mingle imperceptibly as every need is satisfied. The Lord be with you. Now let us worship our Lord and Savior in thanksgiving. That is delightful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Let's join together for our call to worship. I am the good shepherd. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your Lord. 
I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will hold you up with my right hand. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your protection, and your staff for guidance, they comfort me. I am your shepherd. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, you shall not drown. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will be me. Lord, you stretch out your hand against the wickedness of my enemies, and your right hand saves me. You are the sheep of my pasture. I have created you, formed you. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Heart shall not fear. The war shall rise against me. In this I will be confident. You, Lord, are the shepherd of my soul. You are my light and my salvation. You are the strength of my life. How great is your goodness to those who trust in you. I am the good shepherd, and I say to you, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He is determined to give you the kingdom. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's join together in the community prayer. Lord, sometimes we feel overcome with all the craziness we feel as if the world is caving in on us. When it seems each direction we look, we see something blocking our path. Help us to remember that in the chaos is where you do your best work. In the dark waters and tumult, you birth all that we know. In each story of your people, you have restored them from devastation. You even came to walk with us to comfort and empower us. Lord, we pray that in every situation we encounter, we remember that you are in charge, that you are faithful to your people, and that your track record is 100%. Love always wins. Amen.
Please be seated. Children's time. You're here, all right, great. We're all children of God, right? So this is, uh, boy, New Year's, just, what, two days ago? Yeah, yesterday all bowl games were on. I guess that was New Year's Day. Um, wonderful time of year in which we look back and we look forward and... Sometimes, not this year so much, but many years, people get together for parties and sing Auld Lang Syne, and you watch the, the ball go down in New York City at, at midnight, or I guess it's 11 o'clock our time. Uh, it's a fun time of year, and it's a time of year in which a lot of people make resolutions. Anybody here ever made any New Year's revolu- re- resolutions? You don't have to tell us what they are. Just raise your hand if you've ever made them before. Okay. What was it? <laughs> um, I, I've done that before, and it's really a good idea uh, if, you know, if you'll follow through, of course. Um, some of the, what, what are some of the resolutions that people make? Lose weight. Oh, lose weight. Yeah. Lose weight, okay. I like that resolution. <laughs> what else? Exercise. Exer- that's another one. I'm going to get out there and exercise, yeah. Or I'm going to try to be kinder to my spouse this year when I get home from work, right? Um, or I'm going to, you know, I've only been praying sporadically. Maybe, I, maybe I'm going to pray every morning. Or gonna, as a family, we're going to pray at mealtimes. Um, we could, that could be another resolution. So we make resolutions. And, and it's a good thing because we want to change the way things are with us. Wonderful. Now, we can't change the world, but we can change us. I was wondering this week when I thought of, uh, of speaking to you in the children's moment, if God makes a resolution, not what God's going to do, but what God would like us to make resolutions about, what do you think God would want changed in this world that we're living in? What would God change? Love one another. Love one another. Okay, and what might that look like? Give me an example of what God might say. You're not loving somebody there. What does love mean? Being nice? Being nice, okay. Accepting the differences without being critical, okay. What else? Caring for somebody, especially somebody you don't like. Now, it's pretty easy to care for people we like, right? <laughs> but to care for those people that really irritate us, boy, that's, that's a challenge. And, you know, I think God might say, let's share what we have. Let's, we've got a lot of resources in this world, but it seems to me that some people have a lot of resources and some people don't have much at all. And God would say, wait a minute, we're one family. Let's share as a, as a family. So, as we go into the year, um, you know, we can pray and ask God to change things, but maybe we can all work on some things that we hope God will change within ourselves. So if I want to, to love one another, maybe I have to love those people that are on the other side of the political divide for me, which I often don't say nice things about. I don't know what side you're on, but I bet you don't say nice things about some of those people either, right? So maybe God wants us to start where we're at in loving one another and treating one another more kindly and in sharing our bountiful resources with others. So let's pray. God, we thank you for this new year. And as we look forward, we want to make some resolutions in our heart. We want to resolve to be more like Jesus. That's why we're here. So God, would you help us this year to love others, to be kind to those who may not be kind to us, to care about and to want the best for those who we dislike. Help us, Lord, to do this because on ourselves, by ourselves, we just can't, and we haven't done very well. So give us the power and remind us every time we get angry with somebody who's different than us, that they're your children too. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our first scripture today is from the book of Isaiah, and um, I'm going to repeat myself this morning because I'm going to say a lot of this stuff in this sermon too, but as you go home, if you're with somebody, I want because I'm going to say it twice, I want you to quiz the other person to see if they're listening. <laughs> if, if they don't know it after twice, I don't know. Um, Isaiah was written in different parts, but it was written to the people who, in one part of it, were in exile. Now, in 586 B.C., the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. An uh, invading army came in, the Babylonians, and they took a lot of the people off to exile in Babylon, hundreds of miles from their home to a place where they didn't even know the language. And um, the people were discouraged. <laughs> they lost their homes. They saw people they knew killed. Other people on the long journey didn't make it. Probably some of the elderly or weak died because they couldn't make that journey through the desert. And now they were living in a foreign land, and they prayed to God. Of course, all of us would. If, when something bad happens, we pray, God, help us. God, deliver us. And they prayed and prayed. And year after year, they stayed as exiles. Finally, many years later, they came back again. Here's a message to the people from God through the prophet Isaiah. Um, before they came back, what God did is chose a different leader, and his name was Cyrus. He was a Persian, not a Babylonian. Cyrus conquered the Babylonians, and he let the people go back to Jerusalem. So in this, this passage we're going to read today, it, it, it talks about the champion from the east who is on the move, and that's Cyrus, who's about to change things so that finally the people can go back to Israel and to their homes again. Quiet down, far-flung ocean islands. Listen, sit down and rest, everyone. Recover your strength, gather around me, say what's on your heart. Together, let's decide what's right. Who got things rolling here? Got this champion from the east on the move. Who recruited him for this job? Then rounded up and corralled the nations so he could run roughshod over kings. He's off and running pulverizing nations into dust, leaving only stubble and chaff in his wake. He chases them and comes through unscathed, his feet scarcely touching the path. Who did this? Who made it happen? Who always gets things started? I did. God. I'm first on the scene. I'm also the last to leave. Far, far-flung ocean islands see it in panic. The ends of the earth are shaken. Fearfully, they huddle together. They try to help each other out, making up stories in the dark. The godmakers in the worship, workshops go into overtime production, crafting new models of no gods, urging one another on, great job, great design, pounding in nails at the base so that these things won't tip over. But you, O Israel, are my servant. You're Jacob, my first choice. Descendants of my good friend Abraham. I pulled you in from all over the world. I called you in from every dark corner of the earth, telling you, you're my servant, serving on my side. I've picked you. I haven't dropped you. Don't panic. I'm with you. There's no need to fear, for I'm your God. I'll give you strength. I'll help you. I'll hold you steady, keeping a firm grip on you.
Here we go. Before we start with the uh, gospel lesson and the scriptures, I want to chime in and ask, <laughs> and ask, would you mind sitting out here so I could, when I have to look backwards, and because I, I don't want to keep my back to you when I'm speaking. Um, thank you for doing that. Our gospel reading is a familiar passage to all of you. Uh, the, we heard the chimes play. The last part was with the message of the angels as they sang, Glory in excelsis Deo, or glory to God in the highest. In today's scripture reading, Mary also glorifies God. After Mary finds out that she's pregnant, she visits her relative, uh, maybe her aunt, Elizabeth, and, and she rejoices in what God has done, but also in what God will do. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Blessed. The mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, and he's lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised to our ancestors. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Well, it is good to be with you again on this snowy day. I was really not looking forward to the drive here with the weather forecast we had, but it wasn't too bad. Again, I'm thankful for those people who clear our roads. Hope you all had a good Christmas and New Year's. Again, it was a little different this year, wasn't it, with the, with the COVID, but uh, it was a blessed time. So I want to start reviewing what you already, what I, what I mentioned before about the conquering of Israel, and I'm going to go out in the congregation, I'm going to ask individuals these questions to see if you're listening. <laughs> Had you worried there. <laughs> well, uh, Israel is really, it's important for us and for Jewish people, but it really is a pretty small, tiny, powerless nation throughout its existence. It wasn't ever very big or, or powerful, especially for most of its existence. And, and in 586, uh, before the, uh, the Israel was conquered, they had been playing some games, which all countries do with other countries. You know, you want to maintain your strength. But um, they played the wrong games with the wrong player. Babylon was the most powerful empire in the world at the time. And they went, Israel went one step too far and ticked off the Babylonians. So the Babylonians brought their mighty army and besieged the city of Jerusalem. They surrounded it. And in those days, as you may know, uh, the siege worked by uh, starving people out. You, you seal off the city so nobody can get in, nobody can come out. It means no food can come in. And after months of siege, people got hungry and started starving. And they started dying in Jerusalem. And they weakened and finally, the Babylonians smashed through one of the gates, came in, and easily took over the city. They killed a number of the people. They burned things down. They destroyed it. They took it down brick by brick, the temple, the wall, 
They smashed it. And they took people off into exile, many of the people, which meant they had to walk across very difficult and desert terrains to Babylon. Some of them, as I said before, didn't make it. Well, the people were disheartened. They were God's people, right? The Bible says, God says, I'll be with you always. You, you can pass through the waters and you won't, uh, you won't drown. And people are wondering, well, what, what happened to that promise? Didn't God say he was on our side? And doesn't God care for us anymore? And, and they prayed, and as time went on, some of them just gave up their faith. Others hung in there, but it wasn't easy. Now, they had hoped it would only be a short time in Babylon, but year turned into year decade into decade, and they were there for 40 years. But finally, God delivered them. We know that from the Bible and from our own lives, God's timetable is not ours. Sometimes we want things to happen and say, why doesn't God make it happen now? But God works in God's own way on a different timetable. And so anyway, after... Uh, the Babylonians were powerful, but the Persians started to get more powerful under Cyrus. Um, I think he was called Cyrus the Great. He probably made that name up for himself. You know, sometimes politicians and people in power like to call themselves great. Well, Cyrus the Great really was a powerful leader, and he amassed this incredible army, and he destroyed the Babylonians, and he took over. And the Bible tells us that God picked Cyrus. God says in today's reading, I've, I've chosen him. I've chosen him to free you. And that's what he did. He freed the people. He said, you're free to go back to Jerusalem. And he even gave them uh, equipment or money or whatever it was to help to rebuild the city. Because when they went back, the city was pretty well devastated. God did an amazing thing. God was at work all along. And he helped the, Jews, the people from Jerusalem to start over. And that event was so important to them that it shaped a lot of the scriptures today. Well, let's fast forward about 500 years. Things looked pretty hopeless for the Jews in the first century. They too were occupied. And they were occupied at that time by the most powerful army and empire in the world, Rome. Rome's empire stretched all over the place. And they were ruthless. Soldiers were in the streets. Rome had made it tough in that they exacted taxes, high taxes from these people. And a lot of these people were poor, but the taxes were high. And many of them owned their own farms. It was an agricultural society. But the taxes are so high, they had to sell the farms that had been in their family for generations. Now, the profits from those farms kept them alive. And many of these people were forced to be day laborers. But what could they do against this power of Rome, which was incredible? Rome was cruel. And if people would cross the Romans, they would either be beaten or crucified. Jesus wasn't the only one crucified. There were tens of thousands of people crucified during Roman occupation. The message was this. They put you up and tortured you to death. And the message was to the people, you cross Rome, this is what you get. And Rome kept them in line. But God was at work. God brought Jesus into the world to a poor peasant couple in an obscure village that nobody hardly had heard of or thought much of. In fact, at one point, somebody said as they heard Jesus came from Nazareth, one of the disciples, before he became a disciple, scoffed. He said, ha, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But God used Nazareth and Joseph and Mary. And that holy family laid the foundations of faith for Jesus. And Jesus listened to God, and he came into the world, and we know today he changed the world. The world today is not the same because our Savior lived and lives. God did something wonderful and powerful, which is really beyond the understanding of the disciples, because at first, none of the disciples got it. If you remember, after the crucifixion, they all ran away. They thought this is over. But God works in unexpected ways. Sometimes the timing seems delayed to us, 
But Jesus rose on the third day. And then 40 days later, when he ascended into heaven, he said, my spirit is going to be in you. And you will do the work that I was doing. And the spirit was in the people. And those people, most of them, just a handful of uneducated people, became the foundation of a movement which would change the world. Mary speaks in her prophetic revelation when she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And she says this, by the way, before she's actually, act, Jesus is not even born, but what she says is true for the future. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their throne, but he has lifted up the humble. Jesus was one who would do amazing things. He would teach those people and us about the incredible love and mercy of God, which knows no end. The mercy of God, which embraces the one lost sheep. The mercy of God and the love which embraces the enemy and changes them. Jesus would feed thousands of people with just a couple of loaves of bread. He would heal people who were sick all of their lives people paralyzed, people with internal bleeding, people with leprosy, people who struggled with demons, people who were on the outside of society, and he'd give them life again. He would raise the dead, Lazarus, and he himself was raised. And Jesus began a movement which would touch billions of people. Because of Jesus and his followers today, institutions exist that didn't exist before, hospitals who began hospitals? The church. They wanted to serve those who were sick. Schools for the deaf and developmentally disabled people. Homes for the elderly, like in New Glarus or Fairhaven and Whitewater. The reformers in our own country, uh, most of them or all of them, from what I have read, were motivated by a Christian faith and a love for others because of Jesus. So during the mid-1800s, they spoke against slavery. Many of them were part of the Underground Railroad, which risked their own lives to flee slaves, free slaves from the South. One of my favorite reformers and really a revolutionary at the time was a woman who escaped from the South and from slavery. Um, and her family was still back there, but she made it through. She was a Christian. She's grounded in God. Her name was Harriet Tubman. And Harriet Tubman was known as the Black Moses. Because when she was safe in the north, she didn't stay there. She said, God spoke to me. She said, God is telling me to go back into the south and to free others. Many people thought that was crazy because she was wanted in the south. But she said, God is with me. So she went back and she freed people. She brought them north again. And she went back again and again and again. It was the spirit of Jesus Christ in her that enabled her to do those amazing things. The spirit of Jesus Christ helps us today set up food pantries. And today, I think just about every town in America, I don't know about everyone, but has food pantries. And many of them are staffed by church people bringing food to those who don't have it. That's the work of Jesus. Jesus is still at work. Jesus at work is at work in Habitat for Humanity, building homes for people who could never afford their own home. Now, there's still a lot to be done, as we all know. But people inspired and empowered by Christ have done life-changing things in the world and are still at work today. I marvel at those people who, was it, were, went to Haiti as missionaries some time ago and were captured. I mean, who would go to Haiti today to help others? Only somebody who was deeply inspired by Jesus and trusted him. And they did. And they were freed. We're living in a time that I think many of us, like the Jews in exile in Babylon and the defeated and frustrated people of the first century, 
We're facing a difficult time, a painful time. We're facing incredible powers and enemies which are wreaking havoc on the world. Depression, anxiety, fear, they're all present today much more than they were a few years ago in many of us. And we fear things which are scary things. I am just continually amazed at the, in a negative way, about what's happening because of climate change. And we heard just, what, a few days ago that there were in Colorado a thousand homes burned in a few days. A thousand people are without homes because of a fire in December. And then it snowed. We hear things which, which scare me like, Tornadoes coming in December in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Tornadoes never come to Minnesota in December. They do now. We see things drying up in many places and fires and storms that didn't happen before. We're living in a difficult time. We're living in a time where there's still a lot of crazy dictators around, like our friend Putin in Russia, who could possibly start another war. We're witnessing starvation and poverty in so many countries that people are fleeing refugees in record number. And I think the last couple of years have seen the number of refugees has never been seen before. They're everywhere, leaving Africa and South and Central America, risking their lives because they've got nothing left where they're at anymore, risking their lives for their children's future. We're living in a time of great inequality, which just has, has, has to break God's heart. Where some people are, are poor and we have to have food pantries all over and, and soup kitchens, there are more billionaires than ever. Billionaires. I, I read part of an article in Forbes magazine last week, and, and the last couple of years have been tough years for some, but for some they've been boom years. Stock market, if you've got money in stocks, has gone up and up and up. The people who have, have a lot more. It's been a boom year last year, Forbes said, for billionaires because there are more than ever. In fact, in the United States, there are, I'll have you guess silently how many billion, billionaires now we have in America. 724. Well, people can't get medical attention. Well, some people can't get enough food or can't afford child care. There's something wrong there. Oh, and, and did I mention this? Now, this is a small thing. There's a worldwide virus that has killed 5 million people and uh, 800,000 in our country, and it seems to go on and on and on, and we thought it was done, and now it's mutated again. But aren't you glad you came to church to be cheered up this morning? Well, it is a discouraging time to live for us. It's a tough time for all of us, which is why today we need to remember what God has done and what God is doing. It's why we need to remember today the stories of the Bible, because they're stories of people who are also in times of distress. I love the translation of the message, which we read this morning. God said to these people who had spent decades in Babylon, he says, you're my servant, serving on my side. I've picked you. I haven't dropped you. Don't panic. I'm with you. There's no need to fear, for I'm your God. I'll give you strength. I'll help you. I'll keep a firm grip on you. Today, we need to hear those words, that God is keeping a firm grip on us and is with us. Today, we need to hear the announcement to Mary that God made through Mary and look back and see what God did in Jesus in that bleak time. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And she said this before Jesus was born, because I think Mary was a person of faith. She knew that God was on the move and about to do something wonderful. We need to remember these many other stories. Story about a childless couple, Abraham and Sarah, 
who had no future because at that time they believed their future was through their, their children. And they got to be 70 and 80 years old. God came and said, you're going to have a child. In fact, you're going to have more descendants than the stars in the sky. And they grew to be 80 years old, still no child. And they grew to be 90 years old and still no child. Now, it doesn't look like it's going to happen at 90 if you were a, a, a woman uh, and you've not had a child, does it? But it happened. And I love the name they chose for their child. They chose for their child the name Isaac, which means laughter. Now, isn't that a hoot, <laughs> having a baby at over 90 years old? God works in some amazing ways. And God brought the people out of Egypt after they were enslaved for hundreds of years. And after they spent 40 years in the desert, God delivered them. And in the first century, a couple of dozen people or more, people who had no political power and were illiterate, began the movement which changed the world. Now, God didn't change things, as I mentioned before, as quickly as they'd like, and God doesn't change things as quickly as we'd like. God's timetable is different. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. They were in Babylon for more than that. That's the frustrating thing. Sometimes we have to wait. I guess we all know that from our personal experiences. But God delivers in God's time. Today we need to look at our own lives again and remember what God has done for each of us because I would bet each of us this morning who are here have a story. We have a story and we're here because God has touched us, because God has been with us in times in our own lives of struggle, in times of our own life that we've had heartaches. God has led us through some valleys and given us a new future. I don't know what God has done in your life, but I know God has done some wonderful things in my life, and, and I, I, I'm sure you can relate to some of, these, some of these things as well. God had blessed me in my childhood with wonderful parents. And I realize everybody doesn't have them, but I had such a loving home. And I think back at my parents who are long gone, decades gone, and I think, boy, was I blessed to be raised in a place where I knew I was loved. And my parents were Christians. They were people of faith. They took me to church and to Sunday school. And I developed a church family that I got to know. And I had Sunday school teachers who taught me year after year about Jesus Christ. I had a great start. And it wasn't because of me. It was because of God's blessing. I've enjoyed relatively good health most of my life and had many wonderful things happen. Next month, I get to have a, colos a colonoscopy. <laughs> Why isn't that wonderful? It is, it is wonderful. I'll tell you, I'm so thankful. You see, both of my parents had colon cancer and my mom died at 62. But I don't think I will because I'm going to have these procedures done. And there are people that God has trained and put into those medical professions that can help us to live much longer than we would live otherwise. And we're blessed. Some years ago, 40 years ago, I was in a car accident. It was a head-on accident, a uh, head-on collision. I was driving, and this guy pulled out in the other lane to pass, and he didn't see, look to see if I was there. Now, the the tough news was that I was driving a 1962 Volkswagen Beetle, and in the front, they didn't have much cushion. It was an empty trunk. And so as he hit me, it all collapsed on me. But I came out of it just fine, sort of. I had a broken chin with a couple of pins in it, scar here if you look. That's it. God provided a surgeon who set that jaw so it was just right. I'm alive today. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God in all of our lives who time and time again has helped us overcome things that we have struggled with. It was not easy for the Hebrew people when they were taken off to Babylon, but God delivered them. 
It's not an easy time for those first century Christians who were persecuted and beaten and tortured, but God saw them through that. The time in which we live today is not an easy time for many of us. Hatred and violence on the rise of the pandemic. Seeing our beloved churches get smaller and smaller than they were years ago, and many of us have put so much of our time into our churches, and it's hard to see. But friends, remember, in Jesus Christ, God has come to be among us. Emmanuel, God with us to be our teacher, our healer, our encourager when we get worry, our corrector when we get off the path, to make a way when there is no way, to give us hope and to be our friend. The old song is right. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege for us to carry everything to God in prayer. And now, Jesus lives within us and others. And every day continues to guide and empower us with the promise that he will never leave us and that one day, Jesus will return to the earth to make this earth what God had intended it to be. That's the good news, and that's the truth. So, Happy New Year. When you become discouraged, open your Bible. Take some time for devotion. Read what God has done in the past when things are tough. Pray and take it to the one who's your shepherd and your friend. Come to church. You know, we really need the church at this time. We need to be together to encourage one another, to give one another hope as we do with the words and, and, and the music, to give one another a sense of joy in the midst of all of this. Come to church. We need your support. And those of you who are listening via the uh, computer, it's good that you're being cautious now. But when things get better, come back. We need you. We need one another. We live today by the grace of God as people of hope. We know that Christ was crucified. Christ is risen. And we can be sure Christ is coming again. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, you are our creator. You've made each one of us just as we are. And you fill us with the Holy Spirit. We know that Jesus lives in us and in others. And we are so thankful that we have been blessed by you. We also know, Lord, that we're forgetful people. And sometimes when we go through the, the waters which threaten to overwhelm us and things are tough, we forget. So remind us again, God. Remind us at those times that we're not alone, that you walk with us. And help us to be Christ to one another when others are struggling, when others are going through a tough time. May we reach out to them. May we do what we can to lift them so that we may be your family. We pray this in the name of Jesus who was and is and will be forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. God, we want to thank you for this new year. We first of all thank you that you have seen us through 2021 that you've been with us in discouragements and joys, and that you give us faith that even in tough times we may cling to you and know there's a future. We thank you for the many blessings of life. We thank you for the health care that we receive, for the food that's ours in abundance, and the people who produce it and process it and bring it to us. We're grateful today, God, for road workers, the county and municipalities, that people who get up in the middle of the night so that we can drive safely. We pray, God, for your presence and guidance throughout the following year, this year, 2022, that you would encourage us, 
that you would help us to see when there's op there are opportunities for us to serve and that we may have the courage to reach out to others. We pray for the needs of our world, for all of those who are refugees and seek a home where their kids can grow up in, in dignity and safety. We pray, God, for those who struggle with poverty all over the world. We pray for the people who have lost their homes in Colorado and the workers who are there to help them rebuild. We pray for people who are working in the medical profession, those especially in hospitals that are overwhelmed and discouraged and more sick people seem to keep coming. Give them your strength and give them your encouragement. And be with those men and women who are researching this COVID that they may continue to be blessed and guided by you as they help us to, to move beyond this disease. We pray for those that we know and love, for Alton and Dave, for Gina. We remember Melissa and her children. We remember those who we love who struggle with sickness or disability. We remember Pastor Lance and his family as they return, and we give you thanks for his ministry here. And we ask that you refresh him and give him encouragement in his ministry here in this place. We pray for ourselves that you may give us encouragement, that you may give us sensitivity to others, that you may give us a spirit of joy that we might be people of confidence knowing that you are at work. We thank you, God, and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
knowing that we have all been blessed. Let's go forth in the world to trust in Jesus, to hear his word, to be his people, to be his hands and feet and voice as we extend the grace we have experienced to one another. Let's go in peace and confidence to trust and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you very much. So if you would